Hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's great to be with you on this Wednesday, May 18th. And tonight we're talking about getting baby formula back in stores. Congress is ramping up its efforts to address this alarming shortage and to figure out how it happened. Meanwhile, President Biden is taking new steps to speed up manufacturing. We've got the latest from Washington and more of your stories about enduring this shortage. This year's primary election winners include Republicans who have spread hoaxes about the 2020 election. What does this mean for the future? And where do we stand in calling Pennsylvania's big races? Then, a turning point in Ukraine's first war crimes trial. The defendant entered his plea. We'll have the latest from Key. And what is it like to live on the International Space Station? Two of NASA's astronauts answer your questions and show off their microgravity backflips. There are unfortunately no quick fixes to America's baby formula shortage, but there is some progress in the push to restock shelves. This evening, President Biden announced that he is invoking the Defense Production Act. That would help boost manufacturing here in the United States. Suppliers would have to prioritize infant formula manufacturers over any other customer who may have ordered that supplier's goods. The president also announced Operation Fly Formula, he explained that in a video online. That's to be able to speed up the import of infant formula and start getting more formula in stores as soon as possible. I've directed the Department of Defense and the Department of Health and Human Services to send aircraft planes overseas to pick up infant formula that meets U.S. health and safety standards so we can get it on the store shelves faster. U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy explained this multi-pronged approach to NBC's Kate Snow. From the president on down, everyone is laser focused on addressing this issue and pulling every lever possible to do so. That's why we are working now to import formula from abroad to get manufacturers to increase production here, to get the plant that was actually shut down back online quickly, and to actually redistribute product within the United States, because there are some parts of the country where there is abundant supply and others where there is scarcity. Let's begin tonight with NBC's chief White House correspondent, Kristen Walker. Hey, Kristen. Hi, Joshua. Good evening. Late today, the Biden administration announced it will invoke the Defense Production Act to push private industry to ramp up production of baby formula. The president will direct suppliers to prioritize key ingredients that are used to make baby formula so that manufacturers can increase production as quickly as possible. Now, the White House is also launching what is called Operation Fly Formula, basically using Defense Department aircraft to bring in formula from other countries more quickly. I'm told those flights could start within just days. Now, the administration has been under enormous pressure to take these steps to address the baby formula crisis, particularly with the critical midterm elections looming. Joshua. Yeah, I hear that, Kristen. Thank you very much. That's NBC's chief White House correspondent, Kristen Welker, starting us off tonight. Now, President Biden's moves are just one way that Washington is trying to address this shortage. Tonight, the House is voting on two bills that could also help. More on those in just a moment, but we are also hearing more of your stories about how this shortage is affecting you. Lillian writes, we have an 11-week-old with milk protein allergy. She may need even stricter formula than she's on now, but we can't try it because we can't find it. Lillian, definitely hope you find it very soon. Kim writes, not affecting me personally, but yesterday, several of us at work took down the names of the type of formula two moms in the office use so that we can be on the lookout. What a failure. And Ray tweeted, I see tons of people looking for formula on social media. The administration is reactive instead of proactive. Let's continue on Capitol Hill with NBC political correspondent Ali Vitale. And Ali, tell us about these two pieces of legislation, the Access to Baby Formula Act and the Infant Formula Supplemental Appropriations Act. What would those yeah. two measures do? 
Yeah, look, they're tackling this infant formula crisis from two places. The first of them is trying to get at the women, infants, children piece of this, where they want more formula suppliers to be able to be sold through the WIC system. Because of the way that the Abbott Nutrition plant shutdown happened, it really disrupted people who use that as their primary way to feed their infants. So this piece of legislation seeks to sort of open that up and basically allow more supply to the millions of families who feed their kids through WICs. And then on the other piece of this, Chairwoman Rosa DeLauro explained the $28 million in emergency funding that they're trying to put towards the FDA as speaking to both the supply chain issues, but then also safety issues in that supply chain. The way that I've been thinking about this $28 million and the money that it would actually have an impact with is between the conveyor belt and the shelves where parents are actually being able to pick up this infant formula. This is meant to target the FDA right in the middle of that, effectively smoothing the regulatory process so that they can get more formula, formula onto shelves more quickly, talking about also finding ways that they can get more, more places and manufacturers FDA approved. Right now, there's pretty low staffing from the FDA being able to actually inspect and approve those places, so this will allow them to staff up in that aspect as well, again, trying to target the whole thing but of course Joshua with a crisis like this with families struggling parents worried there's no action that can come soon enough yeah let's take a deeper look in terms of the funding for that infant formula supplemental yeah. appropriations act it would be 28 million dollars the bulk of which would yeah. go to just formula and for the staff to provide that formula exactly. but also there's money for the office of regulatory affairs monitoring the supply chain assessment etc and Ali one of the themes that's come up in the last few days is kind of understanding how this happened and the kinds of corporate practices that may have yeah. led to this yeah, that's a really key piece of this, because even back in February, you had senators and House members on both sides of the aisle warning about this as a crisis, saying that what was going on at Abbott Nutrition, and because their Sturgis plant shut down, it disrupted the entire process, frankly, because there's so few places that actually manufacture this formula. So when one of them goes down and one of their key plants go down, it really throws the whole system out of whack. That's what lawmakers were warning about back in February, and of course now we've hit in the last few weeks the apex of this crisis, they say they saw it coming. At the same time, they're pointing fingers at the Food and Drug Administration, but they're also trying to fortify that agency so that in the future, it can react in a better way. For example, today, Senator Bob Casey, in tandem with several of his colleagues, introduced a bill that would target the FDA and say that companies, if they were having disruptions, would have to tell the FDA in advance, and then the FDA could take some proactive measures to basically bridge the gap in formulas so that you don't end up in a crisis like this again. And then, of course, we're looking ahead to tomorrow because the head of the FDA is going to be in front of a House committee, and you got to expect he's going to get grilled on why it took them so long to respond to a whistleblower letter about what was going on in that Abbott plant in Michigan that has since been closed down. That's a big question that Chairwoman Rosa DeLauro has been asking, and one I imagine she's going to want answers to tomorrow. Ali, there's one more cut that I think we should play, and this is from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. It's rather more terse and not exactly directed yeah. at the FDA, but kind of hinting at other issues that may be at play here. Here is part of what the speaker said today. I think that when the, all of this is done, I'm not associating my colleagues with what I'm going to say right now. I'm just saying it myself. I think there might be a need for indictment. And pardon me, that was the speaker speaking yesterday. What yeah. is she talking about there, a need for indictment? Yeah, I was in that press conference yesterday, yesterday, Joshua, and quite frankly, we don't know specifically what she was talking about. A spokesperson didn't clean up these comments or at lend any more specificity to them. We don't know who she was talking about, what she was talking about. It sort of leaves us inferring where she thinks those indictments should fall. As we're talking about this, though, and again, I come back to the plant that Abbott Nutrition runs, that is one of the key things that was the start of this crisis on baby formula, the fact that they had that plant shut down, and then and of course, it's the focus of a lot of lawmakers here from a regulatory aspect of what they think can be done to better stop this process from ha from better so from stopping this crisis from happening in the future. So again, those comments were incendiary. They really had a lot of people's eyebrows raised here. I was in the room. I was one of them. But we don't exactly know what the speaker was talking about there either.
Yeah, it all just kind of highlights, I think, the, the reality that there's a lot about the supply chain that needs to be yes. clarified, and these appear to at least be preliminary steps in clarifying that. Thank you, Ali. That's NBC political correspondent Ali Vitale reporting from Capitol Hill. Still to come, a midterm update. We will check the latest results from Pennsylvania. The Republican Senate primary there is still too close to call. And later, we will take you high above the Earth to the International Space Station. Two astronauts in orbit right now will answer your questions ahead. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. So we had a feeling the Pennsylvania midterms would take a while to wrap up. And tonight, 24 hours after the polls closed, the Republican Senate primary remains too close to call. Fewer than 2,000 votes separate Dr. Mehmet Oz and David McCormick. If things stay this close, there will be a recount. Now it's just over 1,200 votes difference. Pennsylvania law triggers an automatic recount if the final margin is 0.5% or less. To avoid that, one candidate would have to lead by almost 7,000 votes. And right now the margin is, as you saw, about 1,200. Neither candidate has conceded the race. And as we said, NBC News has not projected a winner. NBC's Dasha Burns is just outside Philadelphia in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. Hey, Dasha. Joshua, all of the elections experts that I've been speaking with here in Pennsylvania say this is very, very likely to head into recount territory. It is just so close. And they say this is significant, that this is probably the most high-profile recount, if it happens, that Pennsylvania will have ever had. And this could determine the balance of power in Congress. Look, typically, recounts don't result in any change to uh, the results. But if this gets within maybe a couple hundred votes, which is not impossible, then that's where we could be in that territory where we could uh, really see something happen. It, it could get contentious because these campaigns have all spent millions and millions of dollars on this. Oz and McCormick throwing so much money um, on the airwaves, throwing so much money into resources to bolster their campaigns. They are not going to go down without a fight here. Uh, here's what's interesting, though, and, and this is anecdotal, but just gives us a little bit of a sense of why we are where we are. Are. I've been on the ground talking to voters here for months. Most of them were undecided, most of them until the very last minute. Uh, take, for example, Bruce Fine. He's a gentleman out of Luzerne County. When I last talked to him, he was undecided but leaning towards Jeff Bartos, uh, a local Pennsylvanian real estate developer. He called me this morning and told me that despite his initial hesitation, he ultimately wound up voting for Dr. Oz. He said, look, there's got to be some reason that Trump supported him. Uh, I talked to another uh, voter, a woman named Sandra Finland, who was also skeptical of Oz. But at the end of the day, her and her husband, who initially supported David McCormick, also both voted for Oz. And last example for you here, a gentleman named Ken Rucci, we met at an Oz rally, but he was leaning towards Barnett and ultimately voted for McCormick. And I tell you this because, first of all, uh, it's, it's important to understand uh, where Trump's influence uh, plays in here because so many voters were skeptical of Oz. And this entire time, my question was, uh, are they ultimately still going to trust in the president and trust in the man that he has supported at the end of the day, and many of them did. Uh, but this also shows you just how much they've been struggling to parse through the information and misinformation that's been out there on the airwaves and on the Internet. And now here we are, uh, almost 24 hours after the polls have closed, and we still don't know who has won in this primary, Joshua. Yeah, Dasha, we may not know for a while. Thank you very much. That's NBC's Dasha Burns reporting from Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. Let's continue now with MSNBC political analyst Jonathan Alter. He's an author and a columnist with The Daily Beast. And Jonathan, I wonder what you make of where we stand so far with the Pennsylvania Republican primary. I know there were a lot of other races of importance, but this was one of the big ones for an array of different reasons. What do you make of where we stand right now? Well, just to back up Joshua and explain why the stakes are so high, this is the Democrats' best shot for a pickup in the U.S. Senate. In other words, flipping a seat from Republican to Democratic. The incumbent uh, is retiring, so, and he's a Republican, so the seat is 
open. And uh, this is why uh, there's so much attention on this race. Now, what's not clear beside the winner of the primary on the Republican side is which candidate would be stronger against John Fetterman in the general election. As we all know, uh, Fetterman won big in his primary on the Democratic side. He has a lot of support across Pennsylvania. He's won statewide. He's the lieutenant governor uh, and is considered the favorite going into um, this general election. But what is causing a lot of uh, scratching of heads is whether McCormick or Oz is the stronger Republican candidate against him. There was another candidate that surged kind of late in the race, Kathy Barnett, who is a conservative right. commentator. Uh, currently, she is third. You know, Mehmet Oz and David McCormick are very, very close right now, and we are still characterizing it too close to call. But what do you make of her kind of sudden rise in, right near the primary election day here? Well, it was extraordinary, and it showed um, that there were a lot of Pennsylvania Republicans who found both Oz and McCormick, kind of weak T, not right wing enough for them. So Barnett tapped into that, but uh, I was actually surprised she didn't do better because she started surging last week in the polls. And usually the candidate with momentum, uh, you know, does a little better than expected. And she did a little worse uh, than expected, but you can expect that she'll be around uh, for another try in Pennsylvania politics. And she built, you know, she built a pretty loyal uh, constituency, even though an awful lot of Pennsylvania Republicans believe that both she and Doug Mastriano, who's the Republican nominee for governor, are too conservative for Pennsylvania. With regard to some of the other races, Republicans in North Carolina nominated Doug Mastriano for governor, he was among the people who fomented the hoaxes about the 2020 election. Yeah. In North Carolina, voters also nominated Representative Ted Budd for that state's Senate seat, and he voted in Congress against certifying the president's election win. Jonathan, thus far, there have been really zero political repercussions for Republicans who support the so-called big lie. What do you think that's going to mean going forward? I don't know what your read is on whether or not voters are ready to move beyond that, whether that's still an issue or, or what the impact of that might be. But so far, there don't seem to have been many repercussions. Well, I think Pennsylvania on the gubernatorial side is going to be a real test of that because that matchup is Attorney General Josh Shapiro, who has made a very big issue of uh, rejecting uh, efforts um, by uh, Republicans to steal the 2020 election and, you know, create uh, fake electors who were not actually selected by the people. Doug Mastriano, the Republican nominee for governor of Pennsylvania, is, was one of the leaders of the effort to overturn the election. And he was actually present on January 6th. He passed the, uh, the barriers on the way into the Capitol, didn't get all the way into the Capitol, but did take part in that, um, in that you know, rebellion, uh, that coup attempt. And then he, he organized a lot of the coup attempt in Pennsylvania. And he wants to essentially politicize the election machinery in Pennsylvania, which if he's elected governor, he will have the power to do. He also, and this is really radical, Joshua, he wants every Pennsylvania voter to be forced to re-register, go out and re-register, which I've, I've never heard anybody propose that. But so you have a real test in Pennsylvania this fall uh, between uh, those who uh, believe in democracy and those who take a more authoritarian uh, view. And by the way, I'm quoting Republicans in suggesting that candidates like Doug Mastriano are authoritarian candidates for public office. Well, we'll keep an eye on the Pennsylvania Republican primary. And I just want to clarify for some of our viewers around the world, because there are many different systems in terms of how votes are counted. We've characterized it as too close to call because although 98% of the votes are in, as far as we can tell, statistically, we can't be certain enough of who will prevail in the race. That's why we're still characterizing it as too close to call at this point. But that will certainly change.
Jonathan Alter, MSNBC political analyst and an author and columnist with Daily Beast. Jonathan, thanks very much. Thanks, Sean. Up next, accountability in Ukraine. A Russian soldier is pleading guilty in the first war crimes trial. We will take a closer look at the case and what it could mean just ahead. Stay close. Russia's war against Ukraine is continuing to shift Europe's alliances in exactly the way Russia did not want. Today, Finland and Sweden officially asked to join NATO. Finland borders Russia's northwest corner and Sweden's on the other side. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said that the group is honored to receive the requests. He called the applications a historic step. President Biden has endorsed these applications, but the process might not be likely to get fast-tracked. All 30 member nations have to ratify the applications, and right now, one is holding things up. Turkey. Its president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, appears to be looking for some kind of political concession. Meanwhile, the war in Ukraine is entering its third month. Today, it held its first war crimes trial. A 21-year-old Russian soldier pled guilty to killing a 62-year-old citizen. The soldier faces life in prison. And in a move of diplomatic solidarity, the U.S. Embassy in Kyiv is open again. It closed right before the invasion. Today, the American flag was raised over the complex. NBC's Cal Perry joins us now from Kyiv. And Cal, let's start with Finland and Sweden. What more do we know about why President Erdogan is opposing the fast-tracked application and what he may want? So this is about the PKK. This is a Kurdish separatist group um, that Turkey has been battling for quite a while. It is also about Fethullah Gulen, who is an opposition leader, uh, who actually is in Pennsylvania in the United States, and some of his followers. Uh, and Turkey is upset with Sweden because Sweden has a large number of Kurdish refugees living in Sweden. And Turkey sees this um, as their moment to bring up the issue, to try to use the leverage they have, because it only takes one country uh, to hold this up, to really have this conversation. Now, officials inside NATO uh, say that this is saber-rattling, that Turkey can be talked to, that they can be dealt with. Uh, but just as an indication of how sort of vicious the saber-rattling is, President Erdogan of Turkey said that Sweden need not come visit Turkey to discuss this issue, uh, that Turkey had sort of made up their mind. So there's going to need to be some diplomatic wrangling because Turkey can hold up this process, but NATO still, if you listen to officials, uh, remains optimistic that they'll be able to get this through, at least eventually, Joshua. Cal, am I missing something? It sounds like this has nothing to do with Finland or Sweden. It has nothing to do with Finland or Sweden. This has to do with Turkey um, and its internal difficulties is, is a nice way of putting it. And look, Turkey is, you know, as recently as this week, shelling villages in Syria. This is about a different conflict. This is about um, a conflict that Turkey has uh, within its own country and politically. It is something that is a difficult position for the United States. We should remind our viewers, uh, Turkey has sort of the second largest military and certainly military infrastructure for NATO. The U.S. has a number of bases in Turkey and has had a long a strategic partnership with that country. So this is Turkey's moment to have this conversation. I don't know that it's going to be well received because, of course, for these NATO members, the priority uh, today, as you're, as you're sort of alluding to, is the war here in Ukraine. With regard to the war crimes trial, we saw that first guilty plea. What more do we know about the way that this trial has proceeded and what this means for, for future trials, the treatment of the defendant? I mean, how clear a picture do we have of this process? Well, we know uh, that it's an intentionally very public process. So we had a guilty plea today uh, from this 22-year-old sergeant who you see there. Uh, but one of the other things that happened today was the judge declared that they needed a larger courtroom because there's so much media there. And, and the government's not going to restrict uh, the media coverage because, of course, they do not want to restrict the media coverage. They want these pictures to be seen. They want the perception that Ukrainian justice um, is being played out. Of course, there's a message here uh, that is being sent to Russian troops um, that they will be held accountable in Ukrainian courts. On the other side, uh, we are looking at the possibility of, of trials in Russia of Ukrainian soldiers who have recently surrendered um, in Mariupol. So all of that is now playing into these trials, um, which are becoming very public. Now, we will also hear tomorrow, even though we had this guilty plea, we'll hear from another Russian soldier who will testify against the Russian soldier who pled guilty today. Um, so it's an indication, really, of, of how and why these trials are so public and how they're planned out, uh, in this case by the Ukrainian prosecutor, and what we may see again on the Russian side, Joshua.
You mentioned Ukrainian soldiers that surrendered, that were taken by Russians in Mariupol. What more do we know about what's happening in the city there now? So we don't know how many soldiers are left inside. We, we know a great deal more than we did. For example, we know at least a thousand uh, Ukrainian soldiers have surrendered uh, to Russian forces. We had dramatic pictures today uh, released by Russian defense uh, officials of them being checked for explosives and handing over their belongings. They will go to Russian-controlled Ukraine, to towns um, inside Ukraine, but that are under the control uh, of the Russian army. And what we thought, and was at least presented to us by Ukrainian officials yesterday, that this could be a prisoner of war swap. Uh, that Russians could only maybe temporarily be holding on to these Ukrainian soldiers is now developing into another story where we're hearing from Russian officials saying we could put these soldiers on trial for war crimes. And it seems like a lot of Russian politicians today on Russian television are saying this is the evidence of Nazis in Ukraine, that this Azov brigade um, is a brigade full of, of Nazis. There is no evidence to suggest that. Um, there are Nazis everywhere, and the Russians will use this. They will use this um, as a propaganda tool for their own domestic consumption in Russia, and Ukrainian officials know that. Um, and so it is a difficult situation where, again, we may see these trials, we may see a PW swap, uh, but it's not clear what negotiations are happening, Joshua. And there's one more piece of this, Cal. We've got these Ukrainian war crimes trials, which are meant to send a message. We've got these Russian war crimes trials, which would be meant to send a very different message. We've also got the International Criminal Court which is involved, and they've said that they are sending investigators to Ukraine. How do those dovetail, not on the Russian side, but with the Ukrainian war crimes trial and then whatever the ICC might do? Do those connect or are those kind of separate? Well, the evidence connects. Um, I, I, I don't think the proceedings will connect. Certainly, you'll have prosecutors working alongside ICC prosecutors. So when the ICC, the International Criminal Court, arrives here, and some, I think, arrive today, some are going to be arriving tomorrow, um, they will immediately be hooked into a system that is already investigating these crimes. So in that way, they're very much interconnected. So much of the work um, to investigate these war crimes is already being done. The bodies are being documented. The evidence is being documented. Witness testimony is being taken as people return to their homes. Um, so in that sense, they're connected. But the ICC, again, operates under this international understanding, the Rome Statute. One problem with that, of course, is neither Ukraine nor Russia has signed up to that statute, which is one of the reasons we're seeing trials take place um, in these countries. But it will give the international community the ability to start documenting these war crimes if they choose to do so, hold their own trials. And again, that process is starting today, Joshua. Thank you, Cal. That's NBC's Cal Perry reporting for us tonight from Kiev. Let's dig deeper into this war crimes trial with Jamil Jaffer, the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute. He's also an assistant professor at George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School. Professor, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thanks for having me, Joshua. Let's pick up where we left off with Cal in terms of war crimes trials. First of all, can you just clarify for us what a war crimes trial is? I mean, how does that differ from... A, a criminal trial, a murder trial? Like, what are the components of this trial that make it unique? Sure. You know, Joshua, under international law, uh, if you're engaged in a lawful war, a war that's been authorized or that you're engaged in self-defense, uh, there are certain things you can do. You can attack the enemy and the like. What you can't do and what are considered war crimes are things like what the Russians have done here. Go after civilian populations, engage in rape, murder, and the like. Now, uh, these war crimes have a variety of definitions. There are, there are things that are crimes under the international law of war, under international humanitarian law. There's crimes of aggression, the illegal going to war, um, invading a, a sovereign nation without lawful cause. Um, and there are crimes against humanity. These things like we talked about, rape, uh, forced murder, uh, execution-style killings. These are things that all lump together. People generally talk about as violations of the laws of war. And that's what we're talking about. We've seen numerous examples of these in this conflict. Now, Cal mentioned that Ukraine is not a signatory to the international treaty that governs war crimes trials as the rest of the world might think of them. So how does that affect the way that would work as opposed to whatever the International Criminal Court might end up doing? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. A number of nations signed the treaty but never ratified it. The United States is one of them. Russia, China, Ukraine is another one of those nations that signed the treaty, the Rome Statute, uh, but never ultimately ratified it. So it didn't come into force with respect to them. Now, there's a debate in international law about whether enough nations have ratified this, uh, this uh, uh, treaty such that it would constitute uh, use codes in international law, that they could, they could come after nations 
that even have been signatories. The U.S. has taken the view that they can't do that. And so that makes it a little awkward for the U.S. to uh, support the International Court, Criminal Court's investigation and prosecution of these war crimes. Nonetheless, war crimes can be prosecuted at a minimum by the state in which they happened, as is happening here in the case of Ukraine. And other, st other nations, as the U.S. is now thinking about doing, might have universal jurisdiction to bring those claims if the individuals come into their jurisdiction as well. Professor, that sounds a little iffy in terms of the, the mm. legal force that this, this treaty would have. I mean, if the U.S. Is not, has not ratified it, if the U.S. is not a full party to this, it almost sounds like it might make more sense, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but it almost sounds like it might make more sense for Ukraine to prosecute these soldiers under their own national federal statutes than under some other international system which may or may not have any kind of like force or effect. No, that's exactly right. I think that uh, in this case, uh, what the Ukrainians are doing, which is using their domestic laws, which incorporate certain aspects of international law, in this case, the war crimes laws, uh, is exactly one approach that might be taken. You know, the, the challenge here is an interesting one uh, with the U.S. having signed but not ratified the ICC, uh, the International Criminal Court statute, Russia being in the same position, Ukraine being in the same position. It makes it an awkward thing for the U.S. to argue that the ICC should be investigating these crimes. You're exactly right now. In the past, the UN has set up individual war crimes tribunals uh, for cases like Rwanda, the former Yugoslavia, and the like. And so we have seen cases where the UN can set up its own war crimes tribunal that all the nations could agree to. But of course, in this case, the Russians won't agree. That sounds like it's got a different kind of a purpose, though, in a way. I mean, it feels like, to me, a tribunal is almost part of a peace and reconciliation and moving forward process, right? Kind of making peace with what happened having a full accounting of what happened, holding people accountable, whereas in this case, it sounds almost as if, you know, if there's a law in the U.S. that would hold any person responsible for murder for shooting someone in the head, this is kind of analogous to that, like, well, you committed this crime, you're on our soil, we can at least punish you in this way. So is this a war crimes trial in Ukraine? Is that term apt or is that a different thing? No, it's interesting that you asked that question because uh, under Ukrainian law, they can bring charges for violations of the laws of war. And so that's what they're doing here is that they are bringing it under Ukrainian law, but the underlying crime is a violation of the laws of war. So you're exactly right. Uh, this is a crime that has jurisdiction in Ukraine. It's being brought under Ukrainian law, but it's incorporating that international construct of war crimes. So how do you see these going forward? I mean, Ukraine's prosecutor general has said, her office is preparing war crimes cases against 41 Russian soldiers, at least 41 so far, for an array of offenses, bombing civilian infrastructure, killing civilians, rape, looting, etc. And we know that this soldier pled guilty. Does this tell us anything about what we might expect, or is it just kind of too soon to know with just this first trial getting underway? No, I mean, I think you are seeing an example of how this might play out. Of course, not everyone will plead guilty, and so you'll have actual trials, and you'll have to prove these things uh, beyond uh, whatever, the, whatever the Ukrainian standard is. I don't know if it's beyond a reasonable doubt, as it is in the U.S. courts, but you have to prove it up to whatever the Ukrainian standard is. Oftentimes, in these war trials, it's hard to get the kind of evidence you need. You know, you're not really collecting evidence on a battlefield and the like, which is why having these ICC investigators there might be helpful and actually might support the Ukrainian prosecutions in their own courts against these Russian soldiers. The other really big challenge, Joshua, of course, is it's hard to go after leadership because while you can get the soldiers that are there that are committing these crimes inside of Ukraine, what about their generals that are directing it? What about the Russian leadership like Vladimir Putin, who are clearly responsible for these war crimes having directed attacks on civilian infrastructure? That's what I was going to ask you before I got to let you go, is it feels also in a way like this is Ukraine's way to get the next best thing to actually having direct accountability for people who are in the Kremlin. They know they're probably never going to be able to lay a finger on Vladimir Putin or his highest ranking oligarchs. So this is kind of them doing what they can in so far as they can to get whatever kind of accountability is available to them. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, that is exactly the challenge of the situation. You know, the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, uh, you know, over two months ago now uh, announced that the U.S. State Department determined that Russia had engaged in war crimes, that Vladimir Putin was responsible for them. Um, and the problem, of course, is it's great. What are we going to do about it, right? Are we going to bring him to justice? Are we going to bring him to account? And the answer, as you correctly point out, is almost certainly no. And then the question becomes, well, have we undermined our own words by calling these war crimes, which they also, also all, all, absolutely are, 
if we're not going to do anything about it. So I think that's a real difficulty, one we've got to sort through as a nation and as an international community. George Mason Law Assistant Professor Jamil Jaffer. Professor, I really appreciate you helping us understand this a little better. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joshua. We will get to some of today's other top stories in a moment, including a former policeman pleading guilty over the death of George Floyd, a major victory off the field for the U.S. women's national soccer team, and Taylor Swift addressing a very special audience. It took some of them four years to get those tickets. Tonight's headlines begin with the case of George Floyd's death. A former Minneapolis police officer is pleading guilty to manslaughter. Prosecutors charge Thomas Lane with aiding and abetting second-degree manslaughter. They will drop a charge of unintentional murder now that he is pleading guilty. An attorney for Mr. Lane says he made the plea because of its shorter sentence, a mandatory 12 years if convicted. Pleading guilty to manslaughter would be roughly a three-year sentence. Two other former officers will stand trial on June 13th. J. Alexander King and To Tao face charges of second-degree unintentional murder and second-degree manslaughter. A federal trial in February found all three men guilty of violating George Floyd's civil rights. Today, New York's governor announced new programs in response to that racially motivated mass shooting in Buffalo. Governor Kathy Hochul said she's focusing on fighting domestic terrorism. Today, I'm signing an executive order to establish a unit within the Office of Counterterrorism at the Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Services, focusing exclusively on domestic terrorism, first time ever. They'll develop the best practices for law enforcement, for mental health professionals, for school officials to address the rise in homegrown extremism. And we'll make sure that they're trained to know how it occurs, where it occurs, and how to stop it. Governor Hochul also announced a referral to New York's Attorney General's office. The plan is to investigate social media platforms to see if they could threaten public safety. Before Saturday's shooting in Buffalo, the suspect had posted on the app Discord about targeting places that he believed would have lots of black people present. When it comes to soccer, the U.S. women's team is flat out better than the men. They've got the trophies to prove it. And now, for the first time, their pay will reflect that. Today, the U.S. Soccer Federation announced a landmark deal with the men's and women's players' unions. Players on both teams will be paid the same. The Federation's president, Cindy Parlow Cohn, and the women's forward, Margaret Purse, reacted to the contract. It's just such a proud moment to actually be a leader in this, to be the first to do it. I do think it will inspire a lot and push a lot of individuals and groups to, to push further on this. Now, this is not just about paychecks. It's also about championship wins. The men's and women's teams will pool prize money at major events like the World Cup. The women have won the FIFA World Cup four times, the men have yet to take the title. This deal comes three months after a group of players for the women's team settled a gender discrimination suit against U.S. soccer. Taylor Swift took the stage today in New York. Tickets cost six figures, and they took about four years to get. It was commencement day at NYU, and she delivered the commencement address. Her speech included some sage advice about finding your way in life. I know it can be really overwhelming figuring out who to be and when, who you are now and how to act in order to get where you want to go. I have some good news. It's totally up to you. I have some terrifying news. It's totally up to you. How right you are, Dr. Swift. And yes, NYU did confer an honorary doctorate of fine arts upon Taylor Swift. She finished her speech with a reminder to the graduates that mistakes happen and they do not need to be perfect. Well said. Now, some folks from outside the NYU community tried to crash commencement. According to our station, WNBC, a couple Swifties tried to buy tickets. NYU students get two free passes, but the university bans them from being sold. 
doesn't mean they didn't get them. It just means they banned the sales. Now, every year brings a lot of high-profile commencement addresses, and we'd love to hear from you about this. What's the most influential commencement address you've ever heard? And is there anyone you would want to hear an address from? Tell us. We are at NBC Now Tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Leave us a brief but brilliant voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. That's 888-575-2622. Or email us, nowtonight at NBCNews.com. What's it like working in space? You asked some excellent questions for the NASA astronauts aboard the International Space Station. You'll hear their answers from orbit before we go. 254 miles above our heads, history is being made. Astronauts on the International Space Station are working on technology that might get us to Mars one day and even improve life here on Earth. Yesterday, we spoke to mission specialists Dr. Jessica Watkins and Dr. Chal Lindgren about living and working on the station. Station, this is Joshua Johnson with NBC News. How do you hear me? We have you loud and clear. We're ready for the event. Well, Chal Lindgren, Jessica Watkins, thank you for making time for us. I, I know you've got a lot to do, doing backflips on the International Space Station and so forth. Could I just start with that? Uh, Jessica, this is your first time uh, in space. Uh, what was it like for you learning to get around in space, learning to, <laughs> learning to do things like a backflip in microgravity? Yeah, I'm, I'm still working on the backflip part, um, but yes, it has been so fun. It's been challenging, but also one of the most fun parts about being up here is kind of learning how to think and translate and move in three dimensions. So learning to you know, use the whole volume and uh, use your hands to translate around, um, it's been really fun. At least I've got great teachers here. Dr. Lindgren, is that one of the things that people, when they get to space, they most have to kind of acclimate to is figuring out where they are literally? in space or are there other things that the body goes through on its first space flight that might feel a little weird. Yeah, you know, moving around in, in this weightless environment is probably one of the biggest one. There are a whole host of things that are going in our bodies that are a little bit different. And weightlessness is actually just one part of it. We're in an environment um, where the atmosphere components, you know, our carbon dioxide is a little bit higher. There's uh, ambient noise that's a little bit different, but weightlessness is definitely a big part of it. And, and so our neurovestibular system has to adjust to that. Our cardiovascular system is adjusting to it. Our bones and muscles uh, will start to weaken um, if we don't do something about it. So we have to exercise every day. Uh, there's a whole host of things that we've been studying for a long time and continue to get new data on. And that's a big part of the research that we conduct here on the space station is actually as subjects, um, uh, scientists are studying blood and bone and, and all of those things uh, to understand, continue to understand the changes uh, that we undergo um, being here in, in this weightless environment. We got some great questions from some elementary school kids and from some of our viewers about what it's like for you to be up in the International Space Station. That last one came from Liam, who is 10 years old, who asked, what else feels different in space? Nick, who is 10 years old, asked, what do you do at the International Space Station? And Jacob, who's 11, asked, what do you do for entertainment? while you're up there. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so one of the, the coolest parts about being up here is that every day is pretty different. Um, we, we kind of have the same structure um, during the work day, but what's filled, what fills up the work day can be very varied, um, which keeps us on our toes and, and keeps things exciting. So that's, that's nice. Um, we wake up in the morning. We have a, um, a large meeting, kind of a conference, um, with the, the seven of us on board, as well as with the ground teams. Um, so teams in Houston and um, in Japan and in um, Munich and um, all across the world in Moscow as well. Um, so it gets all of us kind of on the same page and ready to go for the day. And then we kind of split off to do our different tasks. So we have um, lots of science that we're excited about doing on board, um, lots of different experiments um, that we are, are conducting. We have the, the honor and pleasure of conducting. Um, and then we also have maintenance tasks. So um, fixing things up here on station, making sure that everything is in tip-top shape um, and ready to um, do the jobs that all the various equipment and systems um, are there to do. 
Um, then we also get to do fun things like uh, talk to you all. Um, and then in the evenings, um, what we like to do for fun is, is kind of dependent on each crew member, but um, we definitely like to have dinner together, talk about how our days went, um, just like the, the family that we are up here. Um, and then um, we'll, we'll call home or watch a movie or um, things like that just to uh, keep our, ourselves entertained until it's time for bed. Dr. Lindgren, let me get to a question from Victoria and Ciara about space flight. Since you've flown on a mission to space before, you were in a Soyuz spacecraft back in 2015, and now you're on a SpaceX spacecraft. This was the SpaceX Crew-4 mission. Victoria, who's 11, asked, what is your first thought when you get into space? And Ciara, who's 10, asked, are you nervous when you start launching off into space. Yeah, Victoria and Sierra, those are great questions. Um, I think the first thing that goes through our, our minds when we arrive on orbit is, wow, that was amazing. Because uh, we have just ridden a rocket. Um, right at the end of that rocket flight, the, the G-forces, we weigh about four and a half times our, our body weight. The, you really feel that acceleration. And as soon as the engine shuts off, you're immediately weightless. And you, you get thrown forward into your straps. and. Uh, and, and you're just, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Um, for, in terms of nervousness, you know, I think that uh, fear comes from things that are, are not understood. And, and so we trained uh, for, for close to a year on launching in that uh, spacecraft and, and really understanding all the things that could go wrong and what we could do about it. And I think that really trains a lot of the fear out um, from that experience. Um, I, you know, I think that we all have some level of anxiety as we get onto the rocket. We're a little bit nervous because this is something new and we know we've got a, um, a kind of adventure ahead of us. But I think that we all felt very confident um, about the rocket. We felt confident about our training and really looked forward to that experience of launching and flying to the International Space Station and getting here to, to do the work that we're doing. And now we have that opportunity to look out the window and see the absolutely beautiful um, planet that we call home. And it is, it's always amazing to look out the window and, and look back at the earth where our friends and family live. Dr. Watkins, a lot has been made of the fact that you're the first black woman to spend extended time on the ISS. You spoke to my colleague Lester Holt about that. I, I'm sure that is not at the top of mind for you as you're doing your job on the ISS. Down here, issues like race and class and culture are very much top of mind. You have, I think, maybe the luxury of being a little bit further away. I do wonder, though, who paved the way for you? I had no issue being on television because I saw black men anchoring the news. I thought, oh, I can do that. What did you see when you were coming up that led you to say, I can do that? Or did this you know, career develop despite a lack of role models? What was that path like for you? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting that, that you bring up that certainly up here we are 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 pretty much 100% focused on the mission and on the on the job and getting the job done and we certainly um, are here to do that as a crew. Um, but you're right, certainly um, growing up I had the the um, the the pleasure the the luxury of having role models um, kind of pave the way for me. Um, particularly, I think about um, Mae Jemison and Sally Ride, um, yeah, astronauts that that literally paved the way literally opened the door um, for for people like me to walk through um, and also um I had lots of mentors and teachers and and uh, coaches, instructors along the way who, even even if they weren't in this exact role, uh, encouraged me along this path and and supported me in my endeavors and my dreams. Um, so I'm really grateful for that. A few more quick questions before I have to let you go, Dr. Linger. We got a very good practical question from Nestor. When you have to reboot a computer at home, do you have to do the same thing on the space station? I've always wondered if you have to restart systems or do a system shutdown or hard reset, is that safe? Is it possible? That's actually one of the great things about uh, being up here is that there are a lot of things that are just the same as home. And so if we have a computer that's not working, um, before we call IT support on the ground, we will generally reboot it first because that will be the, the question that we get first is, hey, did you turn it on or turn it off? And it turns out just like back on Earth that uh, just 
powering the computer off and then back on usually fixes the issue. Um, if it doesn't, though, we've got an amazing team of uh, computer specialists in Mission Control that when we have uh, computer issues or, or um, internet connection issues that uh, we've got folks on the ground that are helping us uh, figure all of those things out. It's, uh, it's amazing to be a part of a team um, with such a wealth of experience and expertise uh, to be able to rely on those folks uh, when we have issues. I love the fact that even though you are so far above Earth and we are here on the surface, that a call with IT tech support still is exactly the same. Did you turn it off and did you turn it back on again? That, if nothing else, gives me hope. Dr. Chow Lindgren, Dr. Jessica Watkins, what an honor. Thank you both so much for making time for us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thanks for making time for us. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.